Welcome to the Not in the Job Description podcast. I'm Scott McLaughlin. And I'm Chris Kiernan. No matter what type of job you've had, there were situations that happened to you during work that you couldn't wait to tell your friends about. We interview a variety of guests about some of their crazy stories from work, from entry-level food service industry jobs to doctors and attorneys. We will explore funny, gross, embarrassing, scary, and sometimes almost unbelievable stories that people have experienced while on the job. Keep in mind that our guests or the companies they work for may be masked in order to protect the innocent, or maybe even the guilty. On today's show, we talk to Greg, who is in the business of car sales. Welcome, Greg. Hello. How's it going, Greg? What's up? I'm so glad you got a chance to come and talk to us today yeah. because we've, we've been talking to you for a long time. I know uh, I like people who take their job really seriously, but not themselves very seriously. And in my conversations right. with you in the past, you were 100% about your job in car sales, but you also have a pretty good sense of humor about yourself. So I appreciate that. So tell me, like, what kind of car sales are you into? New, used, how long have you been doing it? Give us some background. Yeah, first off, just uh, thank you for having me on. I love the show. I'll tell you what, this show, I've listened to a lot of the cast and, and the fact, it's just like car sales. I got to listen to every person's job. Everybody needs a car, right? So it's really cool to be able to... That's why I love my job. It's one of the reasons is because I get to hear so many fascinating things. Yeah. I'm but, sure you do get a lot of backgrounds from people. Just Oh, yeah. It's just a normal part of the, so what do you do? In this business, you don't sell cars. You sell relationships, and it's all about just meeting people and getting to know them. So, uh, but I, to answer your question, I, I do both. I sell Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram product, and then pre-owned, I have everything from Teslas to Hoopties. It doesn't matter. I'll be talking to you later <laughs> about a Hoopty. Or the same. <laughs> How long have you been in the car business? Yeah, funny story. Uh, I got in about five years ago. Before that, my career, I was in uh, collections. I was a bill collector. I was very good at that industry. Um, I was actually networking. One of my buddies used to play football at Ohio State with Archie and Woody Hayes. This guy says he's out of work. He needs a job. And one of my buddy's moms owns a dealership. So I go and uh, we're out to lunch and I'm just going on and on and on about this guy. And I say, Hey, look, I think this guy would be great. He's personable. He's been in sales his whole life. He's never sold cars, but give him a shot. He interviews. He actually does not take the job, but we're out to lunch again. And we're, you know, I said, man, and the owner of this company, she looks at me, she's in her late sixties. And, and she said, you know, Greg, you talk too fucking much. You need to sell cars. <laughs> and I just looked at her. I was like, Whoa, well, that's a sign. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing, I was doing, uh, I was doing really well at the time in my career, but uh, what a what a godsend. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, I and I imagine like I've experience in the collections world, and it really is all just about solving problems. Yeah, correct. And so when someone comes to you with a financial issue, you have to look to see what it is you have on the table to help them. Same thing with cars. And what what are you looking for? What's important to you? That kind of thing. So um, five years. Have you always sold primarily? Was it like the Chryslers? And, yeah. Okay. Yep. So I went, I, I just came to my second store. I left the other store after four years and I've been at this current one for one year. So, um, yeah, I love the product myself. So, and I think it's one of those things where you got to love what you do. And I've, I know all the training. So when I came into the industry, I got, I know nothing about cars. Like I don't change oil. I don't change tires. I don't know. nothing. <laughs> I'm right there with and, you, brother. And they say that in this industry, if you like cars, you're not going to be a good salesman. That's just the way it is. Really? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Is it because you're too um, attached to, you know, what the things you like about a car? So you'd have a hard time selling it to somebody else? Like, what's what's the rationale there? Probably. I, I, I would I would say probably because, um, you know, they get into, you know, the, the high-end, high-line type of vehicles, and they're not interested in selling the stuff that people actually need or can right. afford. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Right. That's funny. I, I remember going, well, first of all, I, I lo- I'm a car guy. Mm-hmm. I like cars. Um, my first You'd car. you bad at car sales. I'd be horrible. <laughs> now, actually, let me tell you, I think I'd be good, actually. Right. Um, my first car was an MG Midget. Nice. And it was a lump of shit. Now, I remember it, that car. <laughs> <laughs> I think I abandoned it uh, over at Chris and I's friend's house <laughs> when I was yep. 18. But I remember that car. And uh, I remember when it died, I had to look for a car. So I went to this Toyota dealership. And this was the funniest thing because I'm there with my mom because, you know, she has a car. So she takes me to this dealership. This was probably 1987. Everything there was at least 5000 bucks, And I'm just some stupid kid in high school. 
And finally, the guy who was showing us around said, look, man, I, I don't know what kind of car you're looking for. And I just looked at him with these like, please help me eyes. And I said, something really cheap. <laughs> and he goes, well, look, I, I, I don't have anything on the lot here, but I'll tell you what, I'll sell you my car. And I said, oh, do you have it here? He goes, yeah, I'll walk you right back to it now. Walks me into the back of this Toyota place. He was driving a Datsun B210, one of the ugliest cars you've ever seen in your damn life. It had honeycomb hubcap, like wheels. And I'll I'll never forget it because he looked at me. He goes, you're not going to be pulling a lot of babes with this, but it runs. So I said, how much? He said, 400 bucks. I drove that sucker home. And the inside of it was immaculate. The outside, it was like a primer color blue. It was just, it was a mm-hmm. mess, but it ran like crazy. I drove that thing for probably five years. Nice. <laughs> I remember that car as well. We had a lot of that's, fun yeah, times in that that's car. That's pretty much why people buy cars out of necessity or want. You yes. know, you got to figure yeah. out what your buyer is looking at. And I tell you what, sometimes what they want, uh, they can't get. So, sure. you know, four wheels and an engine and a steering wheel works. S- Yes. Yeah, so let me ask you, you said that, um, you know, you had never done this before uh, through lunch. They said, hey, you're a great talker. You could probably sell cars. So you show up. Did they send you to some kind of training school or is it just all on the job training and uh, shadow somebody for a couple of days and you're <laughs> on your own? The, the training school was, hey, follow this guy around and listen to everything okay. he says. <laughs> gotcha. So, um, I, you know, they actually had me follow a specific person and I decided that that wasn't my sales style. Because you have different styles of sale. Mm-hmm. You have a sure. professional, which I'm clearly not. Um, <laughs> you have the talker. That's me. You have the guy who's kind of an uh, introvert. Um, you, you just have different personalities. Sure. And so you have to find what fits you best. And so I just kind of followed everybody that, that was doing the best, the top dogs. That's where I cut my teeth is just kind of listening. Uh, day three I was not allowed to, but I, I just decided that I was I was done following them and took my first customer and sold him a car day three. So. Nice. Yeah, I, I think I could do okay in that kind of sales job. Uh, I can tell you when I was uh, in college, I worked at, uh, I'll go ahead and say this company. I don't, I don't think they're going to come after me, JC Penney's. <laughs> and I'll never forget because I was in an area that nobody wanted to be in. When I showed up there, they said, where do you want to work? I suppose you want to work in sporting goods. And I thought, you know what? I'll work wherever you guys think that you have a real need for something and that somebody who's really good could turn it around. And they were like, welcome to luggage. <laughs> so I started working in the luggage area. And you might think, God, that'd be boring as hell. You'd partially be right. But I was in college. So that was perfect. And I would just go around and read all the material on the luggage. Dude, over four years, I tripled the size of the luggage department at, at this mall in the JC Penney's. And I had people from like uh, Samsonite paying me on the side. And by the way, this person I don't think works at Penny's anymore. I won't name him. But the person from uh, Samsonite went to him and said, you know, how, how are you guys selling all this luggage? And he just pointed to me and he goes, that nerd right there, he <laughs> reads all this shit. So they actually gave me a, a separate uh, paycheck every quarter based on how much Samson I, and I told him, I'm not going to sell more of yours if people are looking for cheaper things. And he goes, I just want you to keep doing what you're doing. So yeah, <laughs> nice. yeah I, I do enjoy finding out what people's needs really are. And I think that probably translates in any sales job, right? Well, and I tell you, I was running around like a like a chicken with his head cut off. I was eager to learn. It was new. You know, I'm in my my late 30s at this point. I sold 36 cars my first month, and wow, the average salesman in America sells 10 to 12 cars a month. So, I mean, I I murdered it. They actually yeah. had a, a sales meeting the next month, and I was told to stay out of it. And uh, they all got their head ripped off because oh, the they new had guy to love that has you. no idea what they're yeah. doing, he's doing right. is out selling them. So. Then the day after that, fucking Greg's here today. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. They come to love me. <laughs> you won them over with your personality. Sure. <laughs> right. Well, you know, the thing about any kind of sales where you're dealing with uh, the general population, you have to have some stories. I mean, mm. you just have to. J- just on a regular day, the kind of people that come in and since you sell new cars and used cars, you probably have a wide variety of people buying Um, any interesting customers that come to mind. So yeah, one of actually my favorite uh, sales of all time was uh, it was a late afternoon in the midsummer 
and it's dead. I mean, we got no customers, and there's probably eight salesmen were out, outside telling stories because that. I mean, there's a lot of downtime in the car industry. You just, I mean, that's that's the fun part. You know, I feel like I don't really work, honestly. Yeah. So there's this guy. He looks homeless, and he's just walking down the street. And I'm saying, "Hey guys, watch this." I say, "Hey buddy, aren't you sick of walking? Come on in. Let's buy a car." <laughs> and a guy comes in, and 20 minutes later, I swear to God, he's driving out the lot with party. <laughs> You must have pissed off more people at the dealership again. Like, this guy's dropped. pulling people off the streets. What's wrong with you people? They, uh, it was it was pretty funny. They're like at, at that time. I feel like I had like this God moment where I was it. I had arrived. <laughs> you were just looking for another stranger to tap on the shoulder and sell a car to. <laughs> and that's another funny story. Speaking of God, you know, a lot of people are like, "Hey, let's pray on it." And I'm like, you know, that's all. You, you hear that more times than not. Well, this is about three months ago. Um, one of the salesmen comes up to me and he says, um, Hey, I, I have this Bible. I was going to throw it in the trash, but someone left it in the car. I was going to throw it in the trash, but I didn't want to see a customer to see this Bible in the trash. Yeah. So do you, do you want it? And I'm like, sure. So, you know, I put it in my drawer and then later that day, literally had a customer say, let's pray. And I said, that's great. Let's, you know, I pull out the Bible and I put it on the <laughs> desk and I put my hand on it, bow my head and, uh, you know, 20 minutes later, they're driving off the lot with the car. So. so now you keep a Bible, you keep the Quran, yeah, you did. keep like everything you know, that you could have somebody pray to. Yeah, I sent out a mass email, I have a Bible available if needed. You're like, Buddha, I have him right here. <laughs> Rub the belly for luck. You know, every time I talk to people who deal with uh, anybody in the public, I get a kick out of just listening to other stories. Even just doing research, I found some interesting stories. Sure. And there's a, a guy who used to work in a car dealership, and it's uh, YAA.com. And he said, we had a customer come to the Nissan dealership and go through the motions of buying a new car. But when it came time to do the test drive, we took a photocopy of his ID, which I think that becomes very important later. And he and the salesperson headed out. During the drive, the customer asked to make a stop at the 7-Eleven to pick something up. It turns out what he wanted to pick up was all the cash out of the 7-Eleven. And uh, he planned to use their car as a getaway for his robbery. And the salesperson was really just an unwitting accomplice. Um, now, the salesperson, they say, was not charged. But the robber was arrested. And back at the dealership, when the test drive dragged on for longer than normal, they called the cops. And they were able to track down the robber and his unsuspecting accomplice, um, and they talk about how it's so important to get that photocopy of the driver's license. H have you had people do test drives and do some wild things before? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So anytime, I, uh, first off that's happened in, at our, not at my specific dealership, but at the umbrella company of our dealership. So different. And this just happened two months ago where he did not get the ID because they're not ready for a test drive. I mean, you have your initial meet and greet. Sure. Hey, can I see the keys to this car? I just want to see it. And right there on the lot, guys pulls a gun out and uh, and steals this green, like this green slime green Mustang, <laughs> like like he's not yeah. gonna get right. Yeah, yeah. right. It ended Blends badly. In really he good. Ended, he ended up getting shot. <laughs> oh wow! And murdered. Yeah, by the police. Wait a minute, in a not shootout. in the car, right? <laughs> <laughs> car is toast. Yeah, um, literally, uh, this happened uh, two months ago. It's in the news. He he literally wow. died in a shootout with the police. <laughs> it's crazy. Anytime someone asks to take their the car for an extended period of time, you, you kind of raises an eyebrow because you get people that take parts out of cars. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had a guy come back after three hours of a test drive with you know, 15 minute test drive. And, uh, you know, there's, there's mulch in the back of the bed, <laughs> you know, and I heard during the pandemic, yeah. like, you know, people are saying like, it's cheaper, uh, cause gas prices are so high. It's cheaper to go test drive a, a car oh, and do your brilliant. errands. Run yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I actually did that uh, when I was 19 years nice. old. you're that guy. I, yeah. I am. Um, Does he look familiar yet? <laughs> I'm 19. We're trying to move from one apartment to the next. We have, uh, we just have cars. And uh, one of my roommates, his older brother goes, well, why don't you just go test drive a pickup truck? So we go and, and <laughs> we get there and we're like, oh, that's a good idea. And we get there and he goes, well, get out and go talk to the guy. I'm like, well, why do I got to do it? He goes, because it's my idea. Okay, fine. <laughs> So I go and I tell the guy, and now these are used, beat up pickup trucks. And I just tell the guy that um, I'm going into business with my dad, or I'm going to work for my dad, not going into business, but my dad's in construction. I'm going to start working with my dad. He wants me to get a reliable truck. But um, before he'll sign off on it, I got to take the truck to him to be looked at. So the first dealership, the guy rode with me on the test drive, wouldn't give it up. 
the second one, the guy was like, okay, sure. So, I mean, he took pictures of my ID and everything. So we hurry up, go to the apartment, load up the mattresses. We drive right by the dealership, <laughs> <laughs> unload the mattresses. I go back and uh, he's like, so what'd your dad think? I go, oh yeah, he said this isn't a good truck. The, oh. the, the, the suspension shot, the engine. He's like, what? Tell your dad to call me. This is a nice truck. <laughs> I go, hey man, I'm sorry. I'm just doing what my dad says. <laughs> That's nice. A- yeah, it, it, and it happens more time, you know. Oh yeah. Well, I'm trying to think. Is the guy who used to, the actor who used to be on Third Rock from the Sun, was a French Stewart? Is that his name? Mm-hmm. He was on some show and he was talking about his father was a real dirtbag like Chris. And um, he said that when he was little, his parents were separated or something, but he'd go out with his dad and his dad'd be like, okay, time to go shopping. And they would go to like a Hertz rent a car and they'd rent a car for the day and they would take it right to his house and remove the tires and remove the wheels and just swap them out with the old tires. And he was like, see son, we just saved five, five hundred dollars I mean, it just people right, are pretty, right. uh, pretty resourceful when they need to be. And, you know, kind of what you said too, Greg, one of the stories I read the other day was uh, a car dealership owner hired a salesman who was entertaining some prospective buyers. And they thought, oh, it's just this elderly looking couple. They put down 500 bucks and they wanted to buy an S500 Mercedes. And 500 bucks was just the holding thing. But they were like, eh, we'll go ahead and just let them take the car out. They drove away, test drove it, and came back 45 minutes later saying the check engine light popped on and it scared them, so no sale. Well, they started looking at it. They'd removed (laughs) $2,500 worth of parts from the car so they could fix their S500 sitting in their own driveway. So needless to say, uh, they were caught up and had to pay for all that. They were about to send them to jail. It's always the ones that you don't expect to. Uh, You know, we absolutely judge you as car salesmen, Mm -hmm. which, you know, it's good and bad. I try not to read a book by the cover. You go out in California sure. and a guy looks homeless is actually rich and the rich people are actually poor. Yeah. Yeah. So I keep that in mind. And I've sold a lot of cars to people that didn't look like they could get a car and I ended up having perfect credit and $10,000 down. So yeah. right. you never right. know what you're going to get. Uh, there's this one time, um, this, this well-to-do soccer mom, I mean, she comes in and she, she's good looking. She's got, you know, the yoga pants on and, you know, God bless her. just, she's a beautiful woman. And uh, make up, and she's trading in her car. And when I went to appraise the vehicle, it was the worst, filthiest, most <laughs> vile piece of trash I've ever seen in my life. We're talking that trash started on the ground and went up past the dash, whoa, onto the where the headrest is, onto the seat. Wow. And we're talking like Red Bull cans, coffee cups, cigarette. That's butts. gross, man. Oh, it was nasty. And so it just shows you don't judge a book by its cover because, right? Wow, yeah, you know they they used to teach us that. I what our and, house looked like? Oh my god, <laughs> maybe maybe you don't want to know. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have had an experience, but years and years ago, um, there's a there's a road here in, in Ohio in central Ohio that used to just be nothing but car dealership after car dealerships, Morse Road, mm-hmm. and um, we went looking for a car, and at the time. We were probably, first of all, we were doing it Saturday afternoon. So we probably were wearing sweatpants uh, and looked like we just rolled out of bed because we had just rolled out of bed. <laughs> and we roll up there, and the first guy looks at us and is like, can we help you? And I said, sure, yeah, we're just looking for a car. He immediately took us, I mean, literally almost by the arm and pointed me to the cheapest cars they had, which I'm like, Really? do I need to brush my hair before I come to this thing? <laughs> but it my and I just kind of giggled it off because I'm like, oh, this guy doesn't understand what he's doing. My wife was offended. She was like, oh, sure. well, who the hell does this guy think he is? And, you know, that kind of stuff sticks with you. And even in the grand business of luggage, I remember people coming in and looking like they were homeless and me going, what do you need? And having a conversation with them. Next thing you know, they're buying you know $3,200 worth of luggage. And that happened quite often. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you look at people and, and you know, I, I'm always just happy go lucky because I'm not, I like the quick hit of selling the car and 15 minutes later and they're driving off. But when it comes down to it, um, this is the second major purchase of their life. So right. I think that you got to treat with people with, you know, respect and, and basically not judge them. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes, but you know, you get way more sales just by being uh, courteous. I mean, I could tell you that this is in the middle of the summer this year. 
you know, someone was walking in and I'm just like, hello, sir. How are you doing today? He's like, um, I'm actually a she. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that didn't start off too well, but I was able to turn that back around. Nice. <laughs> so you just, you never know who you're dealing with. Right? <laughs> Literally. It sounds yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I bet, especially at a car dealership, you know, to be a, an effective salesman, you have different types of personalities, like you mentioned, but, and there is a lot of downtime. So when you have some strong personalities, different types of personalities and downtime, does that end up turning into like practical joke time or, or different stuff like that between the salesman when it's kind of dead on the lot? Oh, for sure. Do you remember high school? <laughs> oh God. That's what a dealership what it is. Like. Okay. Oh yes. It's, it's nothing but Tom Fullery. <laughs> Well, you were probably maybe the on the wrong end of some of those jokes when you outsold everybody your first month. Um, I mean, I let my W two talk for my. Head, so <laughs> I don't really care at the end of the day. I'm I'm not there to make friends, right? Right. <laughs> so to give an idea. I mean, assuming that it's not something that's going to get anybody in any trouble. Like, can you think of any kind of jokes or practical jokes that went on? Oh yeah, my favorite thing to do to a new car salesman is, especially when they're with their first customer, they're very nervous. They're at the desk, and I'll just. I'll walk up and I'll say, Hey, did you, did you call Joe back? And they'll just look at me and there's like, there's no Joe that works there. And they'll say, no, who's Joe? And I'll be like, you know, your probation officer, he's called four times. You need to call him back. And then I'll just walk away, you know? And so one of the times I did that to a guy and the customer looks at me, he's like, I'm actually a probation officer. So oh. that's pretty funny. Wow. You willed that. But yeah, I, I mess with the guys a lot. Um, you know, dealerships are famous for the hanging, for, for the balloons and stuff. Right. Right. Every once in a while, you take a paper clip and you hang a balloon from the guy from the back of his belt without him knowing. So he's walking around all day with a balloon. I mean, harmless stuff. Right. That's um, good. But yeah, we, we mess with each other quite often. Um, you know, it's it's pretty, um, at least once a week, I'll come back to my desk after not locking my computer oh, and, boy. to find out like uh, someone had Googled man boobs and then just uh, put it on yeah. images. And then uh, it's nice. just, you know, up on my desktop when customers are sitting Explain there. Like, that hey, one. Yeah. Well, it actually loosens. I think uh, anything to loosen the tension is better than car sales, I guess. Because people are really nervous half the time, you know. And then, so, and I personally think this might be an urban legend, but maybe you can shed some light on it. I've heard stories of, like, car salesmen coming up with little things in between them, like how they're going to get a customer, like try to talk them into climbing into the trunk or something like that. Yeah. Anything so, like that? Absolutely. That's So that's actually, um, that's not a myth. I mean, it's all about, in sales, It's I, I don't like to, to be dominant over anybody. I like to well, at least make people feel like they're, uh, running the conversation, you know, mm -hmm. you got people that need to be pushed and you got people that sure. want to do the pushing. So you got to figure out kind of, yeah. that's why car sales is so interesting is because there's a whole different dynamic they've done. They call it spiffs, anything that gives you extra money. And they'll say, you know, on a Saturday, first person to do this gets $50 or a hundred dollars or gets to spin the wheel, which has up to a thousand dollars on it. And, uh, it's, it's all about controlling the customers where I was going mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. So if you can get someone to get in the trunk, it shows <laughs> that you have control over your customers. So, you know, you could be very, uh, cunning about that. Like, Hey, look how much space is in there. Just, <laughs> just hop in and look how much, you know, and then you take a picture of them and then you send it to everybody and it's great. So would I get a deal then if on my next car, if I pull the guy aside and say, Hey, listen, I'll pretend like you talked me into getting into the trunk and we'll split <laughs> yeah. that 50 bucks. I, I think that's more of an old school car guy. I mean, you got to understand the industry has changed because oh, there's many sure. millennials in this industry now. And back in the day, I heard stories about guys fighting, like literally fist fighting right there on the sales floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, times have changed. You can yeah, no get kidding. sued for that now. So, Well, and I think the internet makes it, it does level the playing field a little bit. Um, Right, because it used to be you'd go in, really the average customer had no idea what the true cost of the car was, so they were really at the mercy of the dealership. An honest dealership's going to cut you a fair deal. Another one, maybe not so much. But nowadays, I mean, you could, it seems like when I shop for a car, all the dealerships have the same car, basically the same price. Yeah, I mean, there's live market pricing, and there's all types of websites to decide what a vehicle's worth, right? Um, really, it's just what you think it's worth when it comes right, down right. to it, but... Yeah, that part of the industry has changed too. Um, I think that they say that an average buyer spends uh, somewhere between uh, 18 and 40 hours uh, researching a vehicle before they yeah. actually step foot into it. That makes sense. And then at that point, they buy within one to three dealerships. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. that they, they... It's enough you don't want to get them to leave. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. I mean, your, your odds of... If they leave, they're never coming back. Right, right. Put More than likely. 
So there was something you said about that that had spawned a thought for me. Um, oh, so do, do the finance people ever screw you on your deals? Like people give you know, a, a decent offer, but you have to go and talk to somebody else. Uh, I know in the past um, there's some dealerships I deal with that I've bought many cars from, and they're actually really, really good. I have no problem you know, making sure that they make a profit. But there have been some times where you could tell the salesperson was pissed because it seemed like the finance person was like, yeah, we can't do that. Well, I'll, I'll give you a little behind the scenes. Um, and, and first off, I'll say that there's, you don't have to be dishonest, you know, because sure. I'll, I'll start with this. Um, coming into the industry, being on the other side of that table, I always thought car, car dealers were slimy. Like, you guys take advantage of people. And I mean, that's, when you look at it, you don't have to, to lie to sell cars, right? No. And so... What happens typically is there's not a lot of markup in vehicles anymore with right. the internet. And then we right. talked about right. that. Yeah. So, right. you know, you take the jewelry industry, what's the markup oh, on that? thousand percent, 500. Yeah. Right. You know, right. furniture, you know, we're, we're at average from five to 6%, which is, I mean, you're talking about the second biggest purchase. I mean, real estate agents don't have any problem making a ton of money. Right. 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 So when you look at it, uh, the way, the only way that dealerships can actually make money it is off the financing. Okay. And it's, and it's not bumping the rate. Right. That we're stealing that money from you. We get paid by the bank. It's kind of like lending tree. We shop you out and we say, okay, they're going to pay us 5% on, uh, on your purchase, but it doesn't affect the consumer. Right. right? right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Your smartest buyer will come in and he will pay cash for a vehicle. Uh, I mean, that's the best deal. But that's, most people but, don't but you don't want to see him though. No, absolutely. I want to sell him a car. You'll sell anybody, but all things even, do you get a benefit if somebody finances versus pays cash or is it all the same to you? So yeah, the way I make my money and actually every single, know this, every single person in a de- dealership is on commission. Yeah. That's all the way yeah. down to the detailers. Mm-hmm. Good. Um, service. So you have everybody that is on a commission based pay. If I sell a car, I make money, put it that way. Now, the way I look at it is I don't get frustrated because that, that buyer that just paid cash for the car. If I treat them like gold, they're going to send me five other buyers. And eventually I'm going to make that money. I just had a lady. I'll tell you what, this is a funny story. I had a guy, a friend of mine who him and his wife both bought vehicles from me. His wife sends me a client and he sends me a client. So that's now four sales from these people. The coworker uh, then sends his friend, his friend buys a Jeep from me later that day in home Depot, some crazy lady, Runs out and says, I love your car. Where'd you get it? She gives him my card. Those people come in and buy a Jeep for me. She's now bought three. Wow. She's referred me eight people. Yeah, I mean, right. it's, it's just, it's, yep. it, it, I build my own business like yeah. that. And you never know where they're coming from. Everybody needs a car. So right, you treat right. people like gold and cash doesn't really matter to me. You know? Right. Yeah. It doesn't matter. That's, that's nominal. If you get any more for a financing it, deal. And mm-hmm. do you really get that many cash buyers? I mean, cars have gotten so expensive. I can't imagine on new cars. And I guess maybe used cars, of course, but on new cars, you know, where you're looking at 40 to 50, $60,000, are there that many cash buyers? No, no. I mean, your 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 more your cash buyers are more in the fifteen to twenty five thousand dollar range. I mean, you have now. What's interesting is the higher you go up in vehicle, like we're talking about the hundred thousand dollar TRX truck. Those are cash buyers yeah. because that's just pocket change to those kind of people. Right, right, right. So, yeah, um, I would say that under twenty five and then over a hundred thousand. Those are your okay. cash buyers, which is kind of weird, right? Right, right. That kind of makes sense. But you get the same sense. thing in the housing market. You know, you get sure. a three hundred thousand dollar house. People are going to finance it. Two million dollar house. They're just cashing in some stock. I mean, mm-hmm. that, yeah, right. diff- different customer. I did read something. Um, there's evidently, and I don't have the information, so you guys can all just say this is bullshit, and I was guessing about it. But um, I just read something that there's a guy who held a Guinness Book of World Records for car sales, and he worked at the same dealership for like 13 years, and he was selling something like you know, 130 cars a month, and he was just destroying it. And when they started asking him how he did it, um, he ended up becoming one of these motivational speakers because he said... I just make relationships and he went and had an artist draw up cards for him that would just say, I like you. And then he would write him a nice little note and send it to every customer that bought a car from him. And he would send them a Christmas card. And he said, he just, eventually people had to make appointments to get his time because he was just booked eight hours a day. I know that guy. He's actually in uh, Michigan. If the same person we're talking about, he actually wrote a book that says how to sell a hundred cars a month. 
Oh, okay. Wow. It and, might be him, yeah. Yeah, he's got, uh, I think, three personal assistants, and all he, he doesn't do anything but sit at his desk and close deals. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's, 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 I, I love to hear those stories of, of how people, um, the way I look at it is that I own my own business and I use the, the dealership as my overhead. It's free. Right. So people, you know, they, they do get a little envious when you're at the top of, of the order every single month. How does he do it? Well, it's because I'm bringing in 10 to 15 referrals of people right. That, right. <laughs> that I know. You I know? sent you one. My sister bought a car from you. Lovely lady. She, well... <laughs> I don't know about that, but she bought a car from you, and uh, I know she's going to listen to this and give me shit for that. But uh, yeah, she she's uh, very satisfied with that car. Awesome! I'm so happy to hear that. You know, you know, one time I went into, and that's you know, I market uh, to friends, to friends and family, and it's sometimes that's really hard because then you got people that have expectations, right? Right, right? And if you can't meet their expectations, then you're a bad guy. And it's like, you know, my hands are tied in certain situations on right. price, whether it be this or that. But um, I love selling the referrals because, you, you know, they trust me. And that's the bottom line. You really don't trust car people. Some people um, I get just by going to the casino. So like um, a couple of years ago, I took my business cards and I taped $1 bills to the back of them. And I left them scattered on the floor throughout the casino Smart. dollar bill up. And then I, I wrote, you know, $50 off or, you know, like send me a referral. I wrote different things on the cards and I ended up selling three trucks by doing that. So, oh, wow. That's yeah, awesome. You just never know where you're. What did that cost you? 40 bucks, 50 bucks? How $20. $20. 20? Wow. Yep. yep. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. So have, have you ever um, had somebody who's come back? Because the reality is, when you sell new cars, there's a certain expectation that they're just going to be hunky dory right off the right off off the lot. But when you sell used cars, it's not like you guys have owned these things for ten years and you know how they are. Have you had people come back upset over some some uh, things that there's just no way you could have known about? Oh, for sure. Uh, and and so, you know, that's one of those things that um, I, I that's the reason I like this this dealership that I'm working for now. Okay, there's a difference. So just know that service and sales departments butt heads. They're two separate companies under the same company, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so what happens is um, they buy a car from auction. It needs tires, it needs brakes, it needs windshield wipers, whatever, what have you. And so it's then the service sends a bill, which is always way overpriced. I mean, we're talking, hey, we're going to charge you $100 for lug nuts, you know? Right, right. Um, and so they butt heads and they either approve or... So with that being said... Um, a lot of times, you know, because of the cost of the, that we have into the vehicle and the, yeah. what the market says that that vehicle is worth. I mean, if you want a good deal, we got to sell it to you as is, right? This this company I work for now is uh, is, is awesome. You know, it, every every single car gets a service bill, whether it needs it or not. I sold a Honda with eight hundred miles on it, didn't need anything, you still got a fifteen hundred dollar bill, um, but that goes into a pool, the unused portion, and then it gets used to fix other vehicles that actually need it. So there's no button of heads; everything yeah. gets fixed, and that's why I love. But yeah, you definitely have customers that will, you know, want a brand new car for a used car price. And I oh, tell yeah. them, I got new ones right over right. here. So, um, well, hell anymore. Those are those, those prices were coming real close, not in the past eight, 10 months, mm -hmm. some, some used cars versus the brand new version of them. Cause we couldn't get the new version. Right. I think COVID really threw, threw things for a loop for a while. Right. COVID changed everything, you know, uh, used, it was almost like the, um, Used car prices were very close to, to the new. Everything's holding its value. I feel like, so this is my opinion, you have companies like Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And what they would do yeah. is they'd have 150 Nissan Rogues, right? And they'd run them until 40,000 miles, and then they'd sell them at auction yeah. right after the Fleet warranty's sale. expired. Yeah. Yep. And so they flood the market, uh, and, and it brought the prices of cars down. Well, now Enterprise Rent-A-Car is running cars to like 75, yeah. 80,000 miles, right? Because they can't get they new ones. They couldn't get new ones, right. So that, I mean, just that in itself caused all the markup. Yeah. So, it, yeah, your better deal right now, uh, even still today, is, is to go new. Yeah. It, and they're starting to come out. You're starting to see a dip right now where rebates are coming back and stuff like that. It's more affordable. But even then, I mean, you, like you take a Jeep Compass, it's $10,000 more than it was two years ago. Same right. exact car. Yeah, right. Same technology. Nothing's changed. 
Well, that's not going to get any better with inflation as we start mm-hmm. to see rates creep up more and more. Not only is the price of the car going to get more, but the financing of that car is going to be right. more. Mm-hmm. So it is going to be an interesting environment. Yeah, well, three three hundred dollar car payment doesn't exist anymore. No, right, right. Oh, I hope my wife is listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> she insists that we can find cars for three hundred dollars a month. I'm like, no, you, you can't. Unless we're a cash buyer, I guess. That's but. right. Yeah. If you're listening, I'll tell you this. Here's an easy way to figure out if you can afford a car. If you have decent credit. Every five thousand dollars that you finance is about a hundred bucks in car payment. Yeah. So fifteen thousand dollar car is a three hundred dollar car payment anymore. Yeah. And that's not going to be any new car, right? Although it could be a smart car. I don't even know what those go for. But ironically, uh, I was reading Consumer Reports, and they said the funniest part is the worst car you can get to be dumb to buy would be the smart car. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm a s- smart. Oh, my brain's going to explode. Yeah. The old smart car is. Uh, Probably about the size of the table we're sitting at. And uh, right. I think my MG Midget might have been a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I had to share this story because I thought that was funny. And this is right up Chris's alley because Chris has run into customers in his life that have thrown him some curveballs where he's just like, I don't understand. And he'll tell a story here in a minute if I, if I nudge him into it. But in one of the things I, I researched, they said that uh, one car dealership got a guy from a got a call from a very irate customer who complained that while his car drives perfectly in day mode, it does zilch in the night mode. <laughs> After a lot of back and forth, they finally figured out the D meant drive, oh, and the N was neutral. And this guy actually thought it was a night mode and the damn car wouldn't move. (laughs) And I thought that's, that's fantastic. That's the kind of thing I'd run into and have to keep a straight face. So I'm trying to guess which, uh, in my former life, I worked in a grocery store for 10 years. That's it. And you know, you have all types of customers that would come in from all walks of life. And I'm a young kid working behind the counter in the service counter, 23 years old. I'd really only experienced my little bubble of, of the world. And um, a, a foreign person kind of comes up to the desk, and he's from, like, India maybe or someplace in, like that, and he, he says, I'm looking for the sauce. I'm like, okay, well, spaghetti sauce is down aisle seven right next to the spaghetti. No, 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 sauce. Uh, okay, maybe, like, um, Alfredo sauce. Like, I'm running through all these different types of sauces, right? He's like, no, no, the sauce to clean with. So now I'm like, like, polish? You know, I'm like, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Finally, he goes, no, S-O-S. <laughs> he wanted like S-O-S scrub pads, but he was, because he's he not American, it, so he was sauce. reading it, right, like phonetically. And I mean, I was running through every kind of sauce I could think of, and it, it ended up being the S-O-S scouring yeah. pads. So, but yeah. hey, we solved the mystery. Work during the day, but not during the night <laughs> version. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Exactly. Been there, done that. So um, as far as... You know, you you selling cars. I'm very curious. Uh, you talked about a lot of the good things. What's the worst part about having the gig of selling cars? Uh, the hours. I, I tell you, I, I've got it better now than I used to. But I mean, you're you're working. You got to be available when the customer's available. So you, you know, you, you work. It's either do you want to be at the party, or do you want to pay for the party? Right. right. So right. it's, it's one of those things where if you have a family life, um, you know, Saturdays are out right. weekend weekends are going to be out. I mean, I can get off for weddings and stuff like that. And I need to, because I need to put my face places like, Oh yeah, yeah right, right. I've actually sold a car from a wedding. You know, I went yeah. to a wedding. You're the car guy. Right. Next right. day she came and bought a Jeep, but, um, yeah, that, that would be the, and sometimes, and the other thing is, um, sometimes you feel guilty uh, in certain situations because people just aren't that smart. You know, and it's, you're not taking advantage of them, but, you know, at the same time, you're, you're trying to sell them a car. Yeah. And you know that it's not going to fit their needs. But at the same time, you know, this vehicle is coming back on a repossession in about a month. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, my God. You just reminded me of something. Um, years and years ago, I worked for a bank and I was in the area that was doing all kinds of floor planning for car dealerships. So we would we would give loans out for all of their inventory that they would get in from the manufacturer. And one of the guys, um, he was like the VP over the area. We had to take a road trip, which is weird in itself because I think we drove to somewhere in Tennessee. So it was like a four or five hour drive. And he said he used to work at one of these buy here, pay here places. And they used to go to the auctions to get cars. 
And so they would do bets. Like if there was something like a, a I don't know, a red, um, oh, I don't know, Trans Am, they would go, we're buying that. And then the second bet was going to be how many times are we going to sell it in the next 12 months? And he said the record was six. In 12 months, they sold the same car six times because some dork would come in and be like, I got to have that red Trans Am. And they would say, well, it's 4000 down and back in the day, 350 a month. Right. And they knew that they wouldn't get past the first payment. And then they go and repo it and it's back on the lot and they would sell it again. And he said they just, that was one of the things they did to kind of kill time is put side bets on how, how many times they were going to sell a car. It's reason 500. I'm not in that business. <laughs> All right. So, um, clearly you're not in with the service department, right? But your customers rely on them. Do you guys ever do loaner cars and things like that? We do. Uh, and if we run out, we actually have an agreement with Hertz. Wow. Uh, and we send them out. Um, so people that, that bring their vehicle in, it's going to be a day or two. We will, you know, or like a few hours, uh, we'll send them out in an Uber and bring them back in an Uber. So nice. I feel like they take care of people. Have you, uh, ever heard of anybody doing anything bad to one of the loaner cars or that you're aware of anyway? Maybe you don't even see that part of it. <sighs> you know, wow. That's, you hit me from left field there. Not, nothing comes to mind. I mean, every <laughs> once in a while you have one come back and it, Smells like a blunt, but. Uh. <laughs> well, yeah, they're not going to do that in their own car. That right. makes it smell, right? <laughs> yeah, I was curious. There were all kinds of stories about people. Uh, yeah, Luke just sent me a, a message that said, Dirty Mike and the boys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it does remind me of that. Like, oh, this isn't my car. And I'll be honest, Chris, um, mm -hmm. when we were young, we would get rental cars, and there was a saying that we would do whenever we would drive them, and it would be, Rental. rental. We would go over curbs. We would do all kinds of stupid shit. So I can only imagine that same thing happens with uh, with rental cars that well, you're loaning out. I, we I've sold a lot of cars that were rental cars, and you know one of consumers' questions is, well, I know the way I've driven them, and I kind of yeah. look at them like you drove it, like you know, but you know you're safe to you're safe to buy a, a previous rental that was a Chrysler Pacifica van. <laughs> rather than a challenger I'll put right, it that way. right yeah people you know they drove it like shit if it's a sports right. car of any type right that's true because i know i did that's true this is about the time of the episode when i asked chris what did we learn today yeah i learned that if you want to make friends with that car dealer just go ahead and just climb right on in the trunk he's yeah. probably gonna make yeah, 50 yeah. bucks off of you <laughs> yeah work out a deal ahead of time have him bet other people in the office i think he probably work a good deal on it and I learned uh, I'm just going to have to save up and buy cash. I mean, I'm going to have to get a few hundred thousand dollars together and get that Lamborghini I've been looking at. I'll sell it to you. Uh, I knew you would. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, for uh, making it and talking to us today. Thank you. And this is Scott McLaughlin. I'm Chris Kiernan. Saying we'll see, see you at work. work. Thank you for listening to the Not in the Job Description podcast. If you have a story you'd like to share, or if you'd like to be a guest on our podcast, please let us know by sending us an email with a brief description of your story to stories at notinthejob.com.